It's about faith, conflict, and God's power to change your life. Yes, you can by T.D. Jakes. All the people are jealous of you right now because they had more qualifications, but you had more God. And if God be for you, because you run to folk for needs that you should have come to me for, you end up in trouble because they supply through their flesh something that I can only give you through my spirit. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. You left out a word. The next time you say, say my children are not saved. Yes, you can. A three-part series available individually on audio cassette, CD, videotape, or DVD. But for the best value, get the entire set. When you write to us, visit our website or call 1-800-BISHOP-2. And we thank you for each other. I pray now for my brother, for my sister, for the hands I hold. I pray that you fortify their minds, their spirits, that you send a fresh anointing, that when my brother, my sister leaves this conference, they will be totally equipped to destroy the works of the enemy. I pray, God, that in their personal life, you will give them great peace and joy as they do labor before you. I pray, God, that every secret thing, every embarrassing thing, everything that could destroy or break their ministry apart, I pray that you move in the fabric of those things now and that you restore, renew, rejuvenate take away the consequences and strengthen them even greater than they were before. And I claim it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Little monitor sound, man. Little monitors. Amen. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We, we, we very especially honor our great leader and our great friend, the Honorable Bishop Thomas D. Jakes. Just give God another praise for him. Amen, 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 amen. Just, just give God a big praise for him, a big praise. Give God a big praise. <laughs> amen, big praise. Amen. Thank God, thank God. Uh, it's, it's, and and it's, it's, it's very normal to understand the significance of God. God is so great and so marvelous and so wonderful that actually he has to be represented by great people. Uh, there's, 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 no, there's no question in my mind that as great a work and as marvelous a job as Jesus has done for us, yes, enormously magnificent, he cannot be represented by anything less than the best. Do you, do, do you, it's, 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 I mean, it, 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 it would be a quandary if, can you imagine having a Rolls Royce and, 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 and have a mechanic that works on a bicycle fixing it? No, Jesus is too wonderful not to have greatness around him. And we honor God for the greatness of Bishop Thomas D. Jakes. We honor God for his greatness. Amen. Amen. Now, now we're going to talk a little bit. Uh, I, I, I didn't know what to do because they said, there was, uh, you know, there's plenary session. I thought I was teaching a small group, and now it turns out to be a plenary session with everybody. And, and uh, so I was caught between uh, talking about preaching and preaching. Uh, so now I understand that uh, I can be as flexible as I like, and so we'll go with that. Now, uh, uh, I'm going to, uh, and I have, uh, I, you know, I'm glad uh, Pastor Frazier got here on time. He's a computer genius, and he was able to help me to fix that thing so it won't go blank out and all that, so I can talk a little bit. Now, when it comes to preaching, and uh, all of us, most of us in here have to preach at 
least three times a week. I, I'm assuming that uh, three, at least three times a week. And, and one of the most difficult things, particularly when your church begins to grow, is the time to study. Because as the church grows and you do more administrative things and more man management things, then that eats away from your study time. But it was not the management or the administrative things that made the church grow. It was your proficiency in the Word of God. Do you, do you see what happens as you, as, as you have to manage more people, after, after, to, you have to administrate in more situations, you find that it begins to eat away on your study time. And study is actually the strength for inspiration and instruction. It is in study that you receive instruction, and it's in study that you receive inspiration. And when you portray that inspiration and instruction to the people of God, then they tell others and others and others. And if the worship service is wonderful, then you have something to manage and administrate. If what happens in the front room is awful, then you will soon have nothing to manage or to administrate. So the creativity of the preacher must always be guarded. And it doesn't matter what you do, you have to take some time to study. Amen. Yeah. Study. You have to study until it becomes a part of your life. It's like working out. You have to keep working out until if you don't work out, you feel guilty. The worst feeling that any preacher can have is for Saturday night, midnight, and you don't know what you're talking about in the morning. So study, that now, now I get, study, there's, there's, no, there's, there's, there's no substitute for it. Uh, uh, they used to say, just open your mouth and the Lord will fill it, fill it with air. Uh, you, you have to be in the books. Now, there's a Lebronic system outside. Dr. Frazier's operating that system. Uh, for those of us who travel all over the country and all over the world, we have 1,500 books in that laptop. Uh, if I get on a plane in New York, by the time I land in L.A., I am ready for the next day because I have all the sources that I need. Now, let's talk a little bit about preaching. And uh, uh, Bishop and I will we'll talk. I'll feed into him, and he'll feed into me. And we'll, we'll tell you a little bit not only about what I do, but what he does. And I'll talk about uh, some of his strengths. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll enjoy it. Uh, now, preaching. Public speaking says that when you get ready to speak, your introduction, you tell people what you're going to do. Then you do it. And then at the end, you, uh, you go over it again in the conclusion. You, you revisit what you did. Now, that's public speaking. Now, if I were going to the movies with you, and uh, you saw the movie, and, and I said, all right, I'll go. I'll see it. It's a good movie. Now, the first thing that I don't want you to do is tell me the story. Please, please. Oh, this is what happened. No. Don't tell me the story. Because once you tell me the story, I lose interest. Because you've already told me everything. Now, that's one. Now, the fugitive was going on for a long, long time. And every week, you rushed to see the fugitive. You knew the fugitive was going to get away. Because if he didn't get away, the show would be over. Now that's called an episode. Now you and I know Jesus is going to get away every Sunday. Every Sunday he's going to get away. But the reason you went to see the fugitive every week is you wanted to see how much trouble 
he was going to get out of. You see the difference now. In one, you knew the outcome. But you went because you wanted to see how much difficulty. In the other, you don't want the end of the story. Now, why do you think preaching is any different? When you get up to preach, and if you just give me everything right up front, you lose me. To grab somebody's attention, you got to raise some issues. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. Uh, it, it's, like, it's like you're getting up to preach, and, 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 and you're going to present, uh, let's say we're going to present uh, uh, Jesus uh, and, and Lazarus, and the, 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 the whole thing about Jesus and Lazarus. The question you ask yourself now is, why is John repeatedly indicating that Jesus was a friend of these people. Why is he doing that? Because there's a tension that he is establishing. And there's one thing you've got to learn to do is, that we have to learn to do is, we have to establish some tension. Not contradictory, but ambiguity. Why is Jesus so close to these people, but he wouldn't rush? You would think that, since John is establishing so succinctly and so clearly, so explicitly that they are close, that if Jesus should have gone to anybody's house in a hurry when he heard he was sick, surely now, should have been to Lazarus. So right away now, your audience is beginning to wonder what's really going on here. So it starts like this. Uh-uh. <laughs> As you continue, you will understand that the underlining point here is that Jesus is about to reveal himself to his friends because he reveals himself to people he's close to, not to people who are far from him. Mm -hmm. It's in relationship that you have revelation. So now, he is about to put his friends in a whole lot of trouble so he can reveal himself to them in a unique way. That's the whole line. That's the undergird of the whole story. And that is that Jesus is going to show them he's a resurrection and the life. So he, life, so he wants Lazarus to die. See, now, now, now you've got the tension. Lazarus is dead. And the next verse says, and I am glad. <laughs> now we have tension because here is the master stopping when Lazarus is dying. And so now when that point is made, the uh-uh becomes, hmm. <laughs> To create tension in a message is to take one aspect of the message and put it against the other aspect and move into argument to come to solution. You already have the solution, but you present the problem. In order to preach effectively, you have to have one foot in the problem and the other foot in the solution. Because you can't bring us to solution if you don't know problem. As our churches get bigger, we become more isolated from the people we pastor. Because now we have counseling teams and counselors and all kinds of things. And so as we become more isolated, 
we become less connected. And when you become less connected, how do you keep your foot in the problem? Because if you don't know what they're feeling, how can you find a solution? Ooh, I'm with you. That's why even though you have counselors, it's good for once a month or every other month to meet with your counselors and let them go through the list of problems they dealt with and then have them to give you their take on it and you get your take on it and it sets you right back into the word of God seeking an answer because you gotta have one foot in the problem and one foot in the solution. The greatest preaching, however, comes from those of us who have had our own struggles. And I'm sort of running around in circles. I'm going to go back here in a minute. Let's talk about the tension. To create tension, you have to be argumentative. And you have to argue different aspects of the text and give the people who you're preaching to an opportunity to see the other side of what it is you're dealing with. Why? Because they need to exercise their minds on both sides of the situation. Now, you make little statements that draw people in. Peter. I would look at Peter and I would say to an audience, some of you are one good mistake from being used. <laughs> now, I just created some tension. Because I am in a holiness church environment and you have the audacity to tell me that God cannot use me until I make a mistake? Peter was one good embarrassment from being used by God because before he denied Christ, he was one cocky, arrogant, unusable person because he thought he was all that and much more. But after he embarrassed himself and almost lost his self-respect, because here he is denying Jesus after bragging about, about standing up and facing the music no matter what came against him. When that one mistake straightened his life out, but that statement create attention because you know where you're going with it now you've got the saints wondering how much trouble is this preacher going to get in before he comes out Jesus is going to win but they want to know how much trouble he's going to have to deal with before he comes through so it's critical now to understand that you are not going to give a brief outline of everything you're doing in an introduction. You're going to open up and set up the pieces so that you can keep the attention flowing to the very end. Now, when you prepare then, what I do is I write everything down that comes to mind as God is speaking to me about a particular text. I put it all down. Then I go back through it and decide what must I say where. Initially, because I deal with the substratum, I deal with the undergirding concept of the text. My proclivity in my opening is to deal with the philosophical aspect of the text theology the theological aspect. See, what I want to do now is I want to begin with the theological aspect, move into the psychological aspect, because it is in the psychological aspect that people's minds are changed. You do not change minds arguing philosophy. 
I, I, I will point out to you right now that if you spend your time arguing your philosophical position from a Christian point of view, you're going to isolate a whole lot of folk. Because a whole lot of folk don't care about your philosophical point of view as it relates to your denomination. All right, let me talk to you now. Let me talk to you, and, and I'm rambling a little bit, then I'll go and put some structure to it. See, th there's a great shift in Christianity today. We have actually become more ecumenical. We preach cross-denominationally. We are now preaching across denominational lines. I grew up as an apostolic Pentecostal, Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, and you can't get no closed, more closed than that. <laughs> I'm talking about shut door closed. A pantyhose was a sin where I came from. You couldn't listen to anybody who was not baptized in Jesus' name, speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance and living holy every day. Notice, if you will, to get up every day and argue which baptism is right. is going to cause your church to dwindle until just two or three of you are there. Because philosophical preaching divides people. Oh yes. This is your point of view on soteriology. This is my point of view on soteriology. And there might be 20 different points of view on soteriology. And you have just divided everybody in the house. Because now you've got to prove you're right. And you've got to overcome what I believe. So it turns out to be me arguing with you from the pulpit. Whenever I have a fight with another pastor, I can't bring that fight to the pulpit. Because the saints didn't come to church to hear my dislike of another man's position or another woman's message. Because that, again, isolates. Now, at this point, people are scared to bring somebody to church with them because they don't know what you're going to do. I told you I'm rambling a little bit. Uh, they don't know what you're going to do, so they're scared because you may just jump on somebody's skirt today or jump on somebody's earrings or jump on somebody's shoes. Oh, I wish you'd understand me. And, 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 and so to bring somebody to church is like playing Russian roulette. I, oh, you know, I, I don't know what happened to him today. He, uh, he, he, something must be going on with him. Uh, but uh, maybe next week, and the person saying, and never again will I go to this church. Never! because the philosophical preaching that is oftentimes born out of traditional associations. So the reason I became a liberal was I couldn't understand the rigidity of the presentation. I, I, I mean, I would hear things like, 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 the Lord, the Lord is going to come 
and catch you unready because he's coming as a thief in the night. And just when you think not, then he shows up. So as a little child, I'm trying to figure out uh, why would he hang on a cross Why would he have agony in Gethsemane and put a whole system together to save me and then want to sneak in and catch me? So, so it forced me to study. Then I would hear, as I, my study became more pervasive, I would hear, well, he can't preach in my church because he don't have the Holy Spirit. Because he's, you know, non-Pentecostal, you know, I don't know. But then I found out that the preacher was plagiarizing all of the fellas he said couldn't come preach in his church. So I told him, I said, but he preached in your church last Sunday when you got up because everything you said came from him. What bridges the gap for a PAW sin killing everybody going to hell but us? How did I liberate myself enough to be able to preach anywhere, everywhere, to anybody at any time. How? Because when you step out of philosophical debate preaching into psychological uplifting preaching, you have now widened your base because everybody moves and betters their life not by philosophical debate because you can win an argument and lose a soul. Uh, I wish I could talk to you now. Uh, the Bible says that we have to be renewed by the transforming of our minds. Which means now, preacher, if the mind is to be transformed at all, then preaching has to be psychological. Because it's only through the psychological approach that you change your life. I change your mind, you change your life. So the presentation of the Word of God then must step into the solution of the problem of the individual who is striving to move to the next level and you move into the psychology that is necessary to get them to the next level. So when you pick up your Bible and you're about to study something, you ask yourself, why is he saying this? Because once you ask why, you're now connected to the problem and the solution. Because the why says there has to be something deficient or something lacking for him to make this presentation so that we might find the solution to eliminate that problem. And as you eliminate the problems that people have from Sunday to Sunday to Sunday, they gather other people and they come back. Because you have to preach reconciliation to God 
reconciliation to yourself and reconciliation to others and that's all the Bible is about it's a book of relationships where you deal with reconciliation to God when I meet God I meet myself and I'm only qualified to deal with you when I can deal with God and myself you gotta ask why why is he telling me Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Why is he telling me no weapon formed against me shall prosper? Why is he telling me this? Why? That's how you approach it. Oftentimes, the preacher who refuses to move in the flow of the psychological preaching and insists on debating every Sunday. He soon becomes bitter. Yes, because now he has baptized a lot of people, but they don't stay. Mm -hmm. And they will tell him, I love you, know, Brother Pastor, but, but I need to grow. Anybody out here had to grow? And sometimes to grow means to go. And this bitterness now begins to express itself in various ways. And one is, you go into a church where they don't have a standard. Ain't got no standard. You, you've heard that, I'm sure. Uh, they, they ain't got no standard over there. They all going to hell. His bitterness now overwhelms him even further because now there's no presentation that he makes that is not without bitterness. And you can't build a church being bitter. Many of us sitting here have to fight personal difficulties in order to get to the pulpit. Let me tell you one of my, one, 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 one of my, one of, one of my worst, the worst time in my life was having to preach while I was being divorced. And some of the worst times in my life, I, especially I would come to conferences like this and, and, and Bishop Jake's sitting there with, 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 with his lovely wife and everybody's sitting and talking about a first lady and, and all this wonderful accolades they're giving to their wives and, and then I'm the speaker of the night. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering uh, how they really feel about it. My ex-wife came to a meeting one time and, 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 and somebody said, oh, she's not married to her anymore. We don't have to find her seat. And, and I said, I said, I said, I said, y'all please put her where the other wives are, please. Put her right in the middle, right in front with everybody else. You, you follow what I'm saying? And so now, getting up to deal with that issue from a whole lot of folk wondering how somebody feels about you. I said that to say this, in order for it not to come through your mouth when you get up, between the seat and the pulpit, 
Preachers have got to learn to purge themselves of whatever personal things bothering them. You've got to rid yourself of what's personal because that means you're about to put something out of your mouth that's not coming from the Spirit of God. Oh, oh, oh. And, and it, inf it infects people negatively. Oh, I don't want to holler at you. I don't wanna... It's a battle. This is why most of us do not want to hear a whole lot of stuff before it's time to preach. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, 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 yeah. Because it influences the thought pattern and it brings negativity into something that should be pure. Uh, the, 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 so, so now you notice then why having done something wrong messes with your ability to flow. Yeah, yeah, being in sin. <laughs> On your way to preach. It messes with the flow because you were about to make a presentation about something that you feel a little guilt about. Amen. I've done it. And I argued all the way to the church. Yes. Riding in the car, argue all the way to the church. Just an argue. That Little kids sitting in the back seat, we're going to church. Just, I don't know what. Uh, uh, uh. Pull up in the parking lot, and one of the saints come right by the door. Oh, oh praise the Lord. I then have to get up to preach with the wife sitting right in the front seat, daring you to open your mouth. Come on, preach it now, Mr. Preacher. Come on with it. See if you get an amen out of me today. Come on. Amen. And then you say some things and everybody's eyes go straight to your wife. Is that really true? Did what he say, is it true? You'll notice that we say he's not anointed or, or, or he lost the anointing. But indeed and in fact, what you call anointing is really just focus. Because whenever there's something that's a little icky in your personal life, that's moving through your mind as you're processing your message, it cuts your focus. And when it cuts your focus, you start mumbling words, you start saying things that aren't coherent because there is duplicity and ambivalence 
within the messenger. And whenever you have this ambivalence, and, and it doesn't have to be sin, sometimes the mics aren't working quite right. And you begin to give a lot of thought to the mics, and then all of a sudden you have lost your focus. Because that has come in the way to bother you. And immediately, boom, you're off. The preacher who can move the congregation is the he or she who can block out anything and stay focused. And sometimes, for me, I have to mention things to free myself of it. I have to mention it. So after a good, a good argument on the way in, and I'm about to deliver the word, if you know me well enough, you'd know now you got a problem right there. Because I'm going to get up and say something like, uh, you, you know, sometimes we, 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 we're just not quite right about dealing with the people around us. And, uh, But the Lord is going to help us. Uh, my subject today is... Uh, you got to get it off you. Touch somebody and say, you got to get it off you before you get to the pulpit. And sometimes just a good apology. Honey, come in the office, please. Let's, let's talk for a minute before I go. I'm sorry. A good makeup sometimes helps because in my case, the bitterness grew, grew, grew until everything fell apart. Uh, I'm not going there today. I ain't going there today. <laughs> subject. How do you derive it? How do you get to your subject? Because, again, when I've outlined everything, I've got to put them in place. Then I've got to restructure what I'm doing so I know what to say when in that message. Here's a point. You cannot instruct people in depthly after you have inspired them completely. If you were preaching for folk to get happy and they get happy too quickly, you can forget the instruction. And what will happen is you go home and say, I should have said this, 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 this. I didn't say that, 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 because the folk got happy quickly. When the folk got happy, they took control of your presentation. Mm -hmm. That is why, if you uh, if you, you listen to Bishop Jakes carefully and 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 and, and other other preachers. My father said to me, he said, Noel, you start so slow. Uh, 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 people think you're sick or something. Be because in the beginning is the place to deal with the philosophical theology and the, and, 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 and the psychological presentation as you deal with the substratum or the undergird that's holding up the text. It is here now where you can quote Tillich and you can quote Benjamin Warfield, you can quote as you build your subject. And now it also helps you to exercise in it because you're building it and you're beginning to feel it as you build it. Is you're not rushing into it because you're not rushing to the shout. You're doing instruction 
and then instruction leads to inspiration. So the first part of the sermon could probably well be manuscript. Then as you move through the manuscript, it gets to an outline. Then after your outline, you're on your own. You follow. Because right now, you have fed into it. Now, if you notice, you might take a subject, you might deal, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's ridiculous to run from a defeated foe. And that's my subject. It's ridiculous to run from a defeated foe. But you can't ride that. You know ride? You know ride? Uh, you, you can't ride that. So you need a subtopic. Something that speaks to that, but you can ride it. Now why do I need to ride? Because after I have instructed, now I need to inspire. So in to order to inspire, I need audience involvement. I need you touching somebody, you, you, you touching your neighbor, high-fiving your neighbor. But I can't high-five your neighbor and say it's ridiculous to run from a defeated foe. You, you, you see, so, so even though that's my overall theme, I add something short and catchy so that when I get to inspiration, I can use that. Now, understand another thing, too, is that physicality has a lot to do with the ability to push a point through the way we preach. Physicality. Sometimes you get up there, and you're halfway through, and you're tired. Oh, I wish I could talk to you. I'm just going to ramble around here and have me a good time. Uh, 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 you're tired. And tired affects articulation. Yes. <gasps> I mean, and now you got me worried sitting in the view. I'm worried I don't know when you're going to fall over. I forgot what you got to say, worrying about. <gasps> you better come help me. I lose my mind. This job is so demanding because sometimes, sometimes your energy is depleted because of the tension of having to get up to preach. And fear sometimes depletes your energy because you're uptight. So you have to learn how to exercise enough. Yes, yes, hear me and work out a little bit and watch what you eat so that you can maintain enough physicality to present the Word of God intensely and not feel like you're going to fall out. And never let your audience dictate your pace. Never, never. If you notice Bishop Jakes many times and others, they sit people down. Say, all right, y'all sit down, I ain't through yet. I ain't through yet. And you can tell a congregation that isn't used to a presentation of in-depth teaching. You can tell. They're up on their feet before you say hello. A congregation that is used to in-depth preaching. They know how to sit still and listen. And listen until they get to the place where it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's like this. It's, it's, hmm? Hmm. Yeah. 
and now it's time to have some church. But you gotta have something to shout about. We ain't just coming out here shouting. I didn't come here to just shout. I came here to get something from God. And after I get something from God, then I can dance all over the place because I already got it. It's critical to understand the, the significance of physicality in the pulpit, especially those of you who want to be on the field and going from one church to the other, to the other, to the other, sleeping four hours a night. And the tension of this job will get you a heart attack if you do not take care of the body. Amen. You have to take care of your body. The danger of spiritualization, spiritualizing the text. How far can you go? I think Spurgeon uh, helped to mess up a lot of preachers with that. Because Spurgeon took it real far. I'll give an example. The man is in Jericho, and he's going down. He's in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem's in the hill. Jericho is in the valley. The scripture said, and a certain man left Jerusalem on his way to Jericho. Uh, he went down to Jericho. When he went down, he fell among thieves. All right? Now, the scripture is really giving us a description of the man going home. It's a geographic description. Jerusalem is in the mountain, Jericho in the valley, and the man is going down to go home. The preacher says he had no business going down. in the world <laughs> did a geographic description relating to the topography of Israel become a moral issue. <laughs> he had no business going down. If he did, was not going down, he wouldn't have fell among it. Your predisposition that you take into the scripture determines what you come out with. Because the scripture needs open-minded people. Don't have an idea and go to the scripture to make your idea work. Oh, I wish I could talk to you. It, it, you let the scripture speak to you instead of you trying to speak to the scripture because then you will fill people full of subjective theology that has no objectivity to it at all after you get done preaching we can't even read the scripture and come up with what you came up with because you came out of your feeling out of your attitude out of your predisposed predilection for some thought that you had it's important another thought All right, another thought. <laughs> Fighters need to stay out of the pulpit. Fighters. The pulpit is a place for builders. And it is an extremely wonderful craft to build. Uh, Thomas, tell us, tell us, tell us your, how is it that you build so well? People, how is it, how do you, what, what is it you're trying to do when, when, when you get up to talk to somebody? What are you looking to do? What are you looking to do in the building, the way you make, make us feel like like we're, 
were better than, than what we're going through. I mean, how, how does that work? Huh? Uh, how does that work? I think that the critical point about preaching from my perspective is first of all, I'm a motivator. Um, my responsibility is to build because the Bible in the New Testament uses the term edify, which is an architectural term that means that we are called to build, that the body of Christ is edified by that which every joint supply of. Not to be a demolition, but to be a demolisher, but to be somebody who edifies, builds them up. The difference that separates great preaching from motivation is that often motivation just motivates you to give you a sensation or a feeling. Whereas I feel that the objectivity of the preacher should be focused on understanding that God builds by design. What I mean by that is uh, the scripture says, except the Lord build a house, they that labor, labor but in vain, they build it. So what God does, God is an architect. He builds by design. Look at this, except the Lord build a house. Okay, and it sounds like God built it. But then it says, they that labor, labor but in vain that builds it. So it says God built it, but then on the other hand, it says somebody has to labor. So you have to understand the difference between how God builds and how we labor. If when I got ready to build this church, the, I, call, I didn't call a carpenter, I called an architect. And if you talk to the Kip architect, he'll tell you, I built that church. He never laid a hand on it. He just designed it. And when he finished designing it, he had built it. Then the builder comes along and builds according to the design. So if you're going to be a builder in the pulpit, you have to look at the blueprint, which is the word, to see the design. The challenge with preaching is, most in generally, you have the raw materials out in the congregation. You've got stacks of lumber and concrete and mortar and brick, but it hasn't been put together. And the problem with most people is they don't have the faith to believe that the raw materials in the yard can become what the master has designed. So my job then is to motivate those persons who are in those places to believe that those raw bricks covered with dirt and mud and those two by fours, some of them bent and twisted and some have holes in them, have the potential of becoming what the master had in mind on his design and that his design is so inclusive and so comprehensive that he already understood that there would be a certain amount of two by fours that could not be used, a certain amount of cinder blocks that would be damaged, that he took that into consideration when he made the design, and that none of the dysfunctions of the material negate the ability from the, the design being accomplished because a good architect plans even for defective product in the creation of the design. And it's my job as a minister to be a conduit, to be a spewer of hope and potentials and possibilities for if a man seeth that which he hopes for, why does he yet hope for it? And so I am a catalyst to build a bridge to say it is possible. You, do you realize that you have the raw materials? You're looking at a cake, you're looking at flour and butter and milk and sugar and none of it tastes good. Nobody wants a scoop of butter in their mouth. Nobody wants a tablespoon of baking powder. Nobody goes in the kitchen to eat flour. Nobody wants a, just a raw egg. Like let me pop this raw egg in my mouth. And so any of these raw materials sitting out there are not tasty, they're not palatable, and they're not attractive because nobody has put them together. My job as a minister is to show you and convince you there's a cake in you, and if you'll let me mix this up for you, you'll see that you can become palatable and effective in the things of God. That's what we do. And we, we both do it, and we all do it, but we approach it different ways. When my brother gets up and preaches, he, he starts out real soft. He says, like this, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> and and, and, and there's, there's several reasons I think that he does it. First of all, preachers who get up screaming automatically know you can't preach. <laughs> I, I could leave then because you have already put a big sign on your head that says, I can't preach. <laughs> because you cannot climax a climax. You left yourself nowhere to go. And so after a while, we get tired of hearing you screaming at us. 
nobody's having as good a time as you are, and we end up watching you enjoy yourself. And though we like to watch, after a while we get bored because we're not included in the stimulation. <laughs> anyway, my brother gives you an opportunity to, first of all, when you stand in front of people, especially when, you, when people don't know you, they need to look at you. They're not going to get with you immediately. So he gets up, ah, it's a privilege to be here today. Oh, look at the beautiful facility. Wonderful facility. Amazing what God has done. It's amazing. Look at what God is able to do. You know, he might as well be saying A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. <laughs> because he's given you a chance to calm down, settle down, relax into his atmosphere, and he sets the stage. Our styles are different, but our goals are the same, to be effective in ministry. Are you following what I'm saying? He goes up like a rocket. I mean, he, he goes up like a plane. Once he starts up and he gets halfway up and he starts slapping his head, it's over. I'm going to tell you this, get out of the way so he can finish. But I'm going to tell you something. Uh, we, we, in, in order for preachers to be effective, this is something that seldom happens. You have to love each other. If, if you don't love each other, it doesn't work well on stage because you compete with each other. We love each other, we admire each other, and we're very, very different. And for the most part, we, we learn from each other, but we, for the most part, we don't imitate each other. But one time I did imitate him. I want to confess this to you now. I want to confess this. One time, one time, see, preachers make stuff look so good that it makes other preachers want to try it. And, 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 and I'm a hillbilly. I was raised in the country, so I never saw any stylish preachers preach. I didn't know anything about that. And so, Bishop Jones has this thing he does when he really starts closing the message where he takes the mic in both hands and he starts drawing a kiss. I preached 15 years I had never done that. And I decided one night I was going to do that. I hit myself in the lip. <laughs> Blood shot out in my teeth. <laughs> And God said, okay, fool, be yourself. <laughs> I'm out of it. <laughs> Styles are different, there's no question. And sometimes you're influenced by others to a degree because all of us actually become a collage of the people that we admire. But ultimately, it becomes you. Because what happens is, the base that you are, and that that makes you the substratum of everything, is ultimately going to come to the surface. All of us are touched by the people that we admire. And, uh, and, and yes, it, it, it rubs off, but at the end of the day, it becomes you particularly when you're not trying to imitate. You, you're, you're influenced, but you're not trying to imitate, and then the real you comes out, and then that's a maturity. And, and, but you see, it's a, it's a good thing. I tell my kids, you have something that I didn't have. And they say, what is that, Dad? I say, me. <laughs> and so it works. I want to just run through some things and then come to a close, but I'd like you to turn to, uh, to 2 Timothy very quickly at verse 24, chapter 2, 2 Timothy 2, 24. And, uh, and, and if you can bring this up on the screen, I would be happy. Let's see. Uh, how do I back it up, uh, uh, Clifton, Clifford? I, I moved it forward. I tapped the thing and it went forward. Now I want to go backwards. All right. I'll start all over again then. Hit escape. Ah. All right, uh, let's go to the first one now. Yeah. Oh, you're a good man. Uh, I, I have a manual coming out soon. Uh, it'll be in the bookstores next month, and it's, it's, it's an old Jones manual for preaching. I'm 90% finished, and it's, and it's everything that relates to 
how to. It's, it's not a lot of philosophy. It's, I'm not theologizing. I'm just giving you just basic how-to ways. Uh, the goal of preaching, of course, is to achieve conviction. That's what your goal is. Uh, one writer said it is, it is uh, spoken communication of divine truth with a view to persuade. And conviction then is the inner man, inward manifestation of effective preaching. It is to get somebody to change their mind, get somebody to move to the next level, to increase their productivity in God, to produce more of who God has made them. And of course, it's a state of being, uh, of being convinced. You, you're, you're persuading someone. Now, if, if that is so, look at 2 Corinthians and see the attitude. Uh, 2 Timothy, rather, 2 and uh, 24. The servant of the Lord, the doulos, and this is a slave. This is the same word for slave. But notice now, the genitive makes the possession the Lord's, the servant of the Lord. The difficulty with where you are, where I am, is we're between God and the people. It's not always a good place to be, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, of, of, of our humanness. Because I'm trying to be accepted by the people, but I do work for God. And, and uh, I, I, I'm trying to be accepted by the people, but I don't belong to the people, neither do the people belong to me. Uh, this is why we have, we have striven so often to cause people to love us, to love us. We want to be loved, want to be accepted by the people. But we cannot want to be accepted by the people to their point where we are out of balance with God. You see, see this is the difficulty because uh, God has sent me and given me an assignment. And when he gave me assignment, I have to fulfill that assignment. And oftentimes, if I'm not careful, I will allow the people to distract me from the assignment. You see, and, and, and cause me certain resentments. This is why he says, now the servant of the Lord, the doulos, the slave who belongs to the Lord, who is working for God, he must not strive. That means he's not, the, the, the Greek here, he's not a pugilist. He's not a fighter. He's not a boxer. He's not a wrestler. And the question now becomes, how do I not wrestle when I want this thing so bad? And I think Bishop just explained that very explicitly, and that is, actually, the people belong to God, and he's using you to craft them. So how can you want more for them quicker than God? You, 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 see, you see, sometimes we get frustrated because uh, we want something for someone who doesn't want it for themselves. And our proclivity then is to, is to rush it. I've heard people say many times, I'm not what I used to be, but I thank God I, I, I'm not what I ought to be, but I thank God I'm not what I used to be. How do you know you're not what you ought to be right now? Because you're not the one who is setting the timetable of your transformation. It is God who is setting the timetable of your transformation. So how do you know? Oftentimes, the devil has us right where God wants us to be. You see again how you create tension? Amen. Nobody's going to leave behind a remark like that. <laughs> you see how crazy this man is. Uh, uh, not to strive. Stri because striving now, and I'll show you, he must be gentle unto all men. You see the gentility here, unto all men. And notice, not apt to preach, but apt to teach. You never cut like a mugger. If you got a cut, I saw a man with a scar 
from here in the gym all the way here. And he was living. Another man had a little ice pick hole right about here, and he was dead. I said to the man who had to be cut all the way down through here, I said, man, what happened to you? He said, I had heart surgery, open heart, which means the surgeon cut him open with a vicious cut, broke bones in here, opened him up, and put him back together again. Now, the mugger just stuck an ice pick, and man was dead. The other man was opened all the way up, and he's still alive. The preacher should not be a mugger. The preacher should be a surgeon. And even though you open somebody up, before we leave, please sew me back up. He must not strive, but he must be gentle, apt to teach. Because now, if I am apt to teach and I want this child to learn this, I'd say, now, darling, fold it like this. Okay, your turn, your turn. And the baby just said, no, no, hold it, darling. Like, watch your daddy real close now. Fold it like this. Okay, you try now, you try. No, 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 G -g give me a hand, give me a hand, give me a hand. Then you take the baby's hand and then you fold it like this. Now, now notice now, notice, you're not losing patience. You're not getting ugly with it. Fold it like this. Oh, you're just like your mama, you're just so... He must not be a pugilist, and he must have an aptitude to teach. Teachers are calm. Teachers are ready to go over it again and again and again. And, 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 and when you want somebody to get something, and you know they're not able to bear it yet, you chew it up until... Uh, my second son, my, my, my second son, he, he's what they call in Jamaica, nice, nasty. He, uh, this, you know, if, if you're drinking out of something, you say, hey, man, taste this. Um, no, no, no. He, he say, let me, give, give me a fork, man. And let me, no, no, if my mouth touches a fork, he don't want to deal with that. I told him, I said, now, look, let me just tell you something. When you were a little guy this size, your mother used to take the food and chew it on and stick it in your mouth. Whatever it takes to get the word across to somebody you care about, do it. A preacher's responsibility is not to get angry and walk out and go crazy talking mad and, and, and hurting everybody's feelings. No, sir. Your job is to back off and come at it another way. If that don't get it, back off and come at it another way. But I'm going to come at it till you get it because that's my assignment. I'm an apt to teach. Let me, let me show you something. Let me, an apt to teach. And, 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 uh, the time should be about up, I guess. Uh, 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 now, notice now, notice now, notice now. Uh, patient in meekness. Now, th that's a difficult word because prates in the Greek uh, has no English, no English word that's equivalent to it, actually. But, but what it means is, meekness is, I'm in this situation, and God knew I would be in this situation. So he must have a way to work it out. A meek person doesn't get overly excited when things are going well, and they don't get very far depressed when things are going bad. They're very constant. A meek individual is not a weak individual because Jesus was extremely strong. But he was meek because he knew who the power was. 
the preacher who approaches, I used to in my early ministry, get up and do a whole lot of talking about a whole lot of stuff I didn't like. Uh, you know, and, and it turned out, I mean, the people just left tired. They left with all of my burdens. And I finally discovered if preaching the word can't change it, nothing in the world can. All you're running your mouth all day long, get up, preach, sit down, and let God do what he's going to do with his word. Yes, because, because you're, you're striving, you're, you're, you're fighting, but your meekness, now notice this, meekness now, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Don't get it wrong. They are not opposing you. They're opposing themselves. We used to play, we, when I played basketball, uh, there were some guys we wouldn't check. We'd double up on somebody else, man. And, and we leave them alone. And, 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 and why? Because they self-check. We want somebody to throw the ball to them because they're going, oh. the, the man of God, the woman of God, must see people who are opposing themselves. I'm not angry with you. I'm really sympathetic because when I look at all you could be and I see you just so totally destroying yourself from your next level, it brings me to tears. I can't get up and fight you because you're already fighting yourself. I don't need to get up and condemn you. You are already condemning yourself. I need to bring every bit of the power of God to help to bring you out of where you are. And every time I preach, I sit back and look because I'm hoping that God is going to bring it about this week. And so next week, I'm anxious to see where you are because I'm hoping and waiting for God to bring you out. You ain't opposing me. I'm anointed. You ain't opposing me. I'm delivered. You ain't opposing me. You're posing him yourself. Who I feel here. Give somebody a high five. Say, I'm on assignment now to bring somebody out. Amen. Now, you see, see, see now, then, we'll, what time do I take? It's per, now, notice now, the handling of the individual through your behavior because now what God is saying is, I don't want my servant to become a reason why someone won't accept me. Do, do you see the subtlety in the text here? Because, because oftentimes an individual who is opposing themselves would like to find a justification why they don't do what they know they should do. Uh, uh, many times, I, I talk about, uh, many times you're, 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 you're at home, you're at home, and, uh, and, and some people you, 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 you're married to, you know, and uh, uh, some people don't listen to you. There's a difference between listening and waiting to talk. Yeah, there's a difference. We, listen, it goes like this. Are you finished yet? Are you through yet? Is it my turn now? Yes, you can talk. And then they talk about something totally away from what you just said, not even connected. Some people are listening 
to find something to stop them from being what they know they should be. And what the Lord says is, I need a servant who does not mix into my word negative attitude. Because my word effectuates faith in the individual to change, to be transformed. My word does. But your attitude in dealing with my word allows a sensual perception to offset the influence of my word. Because you get ugly presenting my word, then you have now allowed the individual an opportunity not to do my word. I, I don't want that. At the end of the day, I want straight conviction without a loophole to escape when I've got somebody locked into my word. So I need a servant who is literally there but not there because my servant ought to be nothing but a conduit that's not adding any attitude, adding any anger, adding any funny disposition, adding any personal agenda. Ought to touch that too. Because I don't, you know, churches do what they want. People raise money in the way they want, and I have no condemnation for it. But I don't do dynamite as a project. You know, dynamite and pyramid stuff. Because I don't want to come in the church and see anybody as a commodity. I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. I don't want to see you as a way to raise money other than through the biblical way. That does not say we can't have some business things and network. I do that all the time and, and, and do investments and stuff and stuff and stuff. But I don't want to walk in the church and look at somebody like sardines on a shelf. Because it influences the flow of how I preach. I am not preaching to make myself rich. I, I was saying to Bishop the other day, we were talking, and, and it was a marvelous conversation. Uh, we should have it more often. I, I was saying, I say, I say, I say now, you know, uh, we ain't broke. We ain't broke. I mean, God has blessed us. But when we started preaching, we were preaching to perfect a gift and to touch people's lives. That was all. Man, when I was down in Longview, Texas, little church, man, and, the, and, and, and architectural, no, it was just warped. It was no architectural design that went wrong like that. And, and when I first went and you'd shout and, and dance and, and, and it looked like the Shekinah of the Lord would just fill the whole place. It wasn't the Shekinah, it was dust. I, mean, I, I put some air conditionings in the place, and I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm 24, and I'm saying now air conditioning, uh, cold air falls and hot air rises. So I put the air conditioner hot. <laughs> You'd have to sit up there to get some air because in Texas, ain't no cold air falling in Texas when it's hot, 120 degrees inside the house. And uh, I, I mean, I mean, all I wanted to do was bless somebody. I mean, we were having convention in New York, and, and I wanted to go to the convention, but I didn't have enough money to go, you know, like, like I wanted to. So one of my deacons had an old Chevy, 66 Chevy wagon. I said, I said, fix the wagon, man. Uh, 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 
Man, I laid my babies out in the back of the wagon, pulled up in New York at the Hilton in this yellow station wagon that needed some paint on it. And I pulled up in front of the meeting, just and got out to the valley, looked at me like, what is this? What is this? And all I wanted to do was to bless somebody, was to preach. And, and uh, that's all. I didn't care about no money. One day I looked up and I said, my God, I got some money. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Yes, I used to, the first hotel I'd see driving. Uh, if it's cheap, that's me. <laughs> cheap, and I'd ride around for three, four hours trying to get the best price. It was cheap if I, so then I'd come to Dallas, I'd just look for the big ball, wherever that big ball is, I'd go straight to that hotel. Because if you ride around, I, I wasn't trying to get rich. Didn't see people as commodities to put money in your pocket. Because it taints your message. Amen. And then they, uh, Bishop, these, Bishop Jakes was preaching the other day in, in a place in Tennessee somewhere, and I got the word. And, and uh, somewhere, it was, it was Columbia, South Carolina somewhere. And I said, how did the service go, man? He said, a man preached like he was crazy. I said, what? He said, man, I never heard him preach like that. I said, my God, uh, there's something going on. He said, no, there wasn't nothing going on. It was about 25 people. <laughs> now stop and consider. 25 people and he's preaching like he's preaching to 25,000 because it ain't about the money. Oh, we got some money now. Now I ask this question to all of you young people, men and women, who look across and see Jets, Ferraris, Bentleys, houses, and if you average all of it over the years of preaching, it ain't but $10 a message. <laughs> well, I want to talk to you about it now. Now, if you walk up in here and your focus is money, then you're going to do some striving because you're not concerned about making the soul better, you're concerned about getting something in your pocket. But I'm, and that, so you're gonna have gimmicks, you're gonna come up with all kind of stuff, you're gonna be selling all kind of stuff from dirt, from Jordan, water, candles, you're gonna turn off the lights, look under the pew, look under the bench, you got all kind of gimmicks, but it's the Word of God that takes care of your business, and if you take care of God's business, he'll take care of yours. Oh, I wish I could talk. I, I got a few minutes. I'm closing. You, you have to understand the, the significance of this text because God's vessel has to be a pure conduit. It must flow through you purely. That's why you can't have a lot of personal hang-ups. And sometimes people follow psychotics. Psychotics. Sometimes you follow leadership that's got serious mental problems. The blind lead the blind. They both fall in a ditch. Let me tell you, I had, I had that scripture caused me some trouble because I could not understand God allowing the second blind man to fall in. I could understand the first one, let him fall in a big ditch because he presumed to lead and couldn't see. But that's not the principle God is showing. I couldn't understand it. 
So finally, meditating on it heavily, trying to reconcile my feelings towards God about allowing the second blind man for on this because he was, he was very, very, very sincere. And the Lord told me to research that word sincere again because some people aren't really sincere. Right? Not really. Now, he says now, if I'm letting on to somebody blind, And we keep bumping and we keep falling and it keep going confusion a lot of crazy stuff don't you think I ought to say can you see because if anybody ought to know the characteristics of blindness surely it ought to be a blind man you have a responsibility When people are living off every word that comes out of your mouth, you have a responsibility not to be personally aggrandizing. Let him flow through you because people are living on your last word. My pastor says, a woman will walk in her house and tell her husband, my pastor said. And sometimes we don't handle men properly in our churches. Uh, sit down a minute, sit down a minute. To have anything to do with a man's wife as a pastor is like putting a gun to your head. And let me tell you why. He, the man already believes he has to compete with you for his wife's affection. And what we must teach, to offset this, we must teach our sisters never to make your husband feel like he has to compete with the church for your affection. Because he ain't coming to church for that. He does not see Jesus down at the church. He see the preacher. Uh oh, the preacher got you acting like this. Now, and, and now, before you were married, before you were saved, you and your husband did whatever y'all wanted to do. Maybe you didn't like it when it was going on, but you did it anyway. Now you done got over to the church and got saved, and you done start stopping some of the stuff you used to do with the man, and here's what he said, oh, the preacher got you acting. So he's already tense. Amen. In your ministry, you can't, you can't strive with a married sister because she's trying to get home. And if you all would love the Lord, we could stay in here a little longer. I don't know why you all hurrying up. Uh, it takes a while to praise God. Got people in church till 11 o'clock that's married? 
husband sitting on there waiting for his wife to come home. And you up there fussing with the people because you just got a predilection to have a, a church until 12 at night. Send the folk home. They got husbands at home who were trying to get saved. Get out of the parking lot and go home. Your husband is waiting for you. You can't talk all night to single sisters and you got a man at home. Let the folk out. Strive, because many times, God wants a vessel that is not cluttered with a lot of issues. I'm getting ready to close. I got 55 seconds. <laughs> Notice now. In meekness instructing who oppose himself, look, look at the use of the word. If God per adventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, he wants a vessel that's not in the way. So that when the presentation is made, they can't wiggle out and put it on the vessel. Ooh. People say, well, Jones, why are you, why are you, why are you dressed down all the time? Same old stuff all the time. I say, well, I'm too flawed to be flashy. I ain't trying to. I don't know. Because when the lights come on, it come on on everything. Amen. And there's too many haters out here. So the, so the richer I get, the less ostentatious I become. I just play it all down. Play it down. Play it down. I ain't trying to get nobody upset. I was on a plane coming here once and, and, and sitting on the plane and, and I was talking to my secretary, I'm closing, and uh, I said, now make sure I stay at the, the special hotel that I like to stay in when I come to Dallas. And she said, yeah, it's arranged. I said, I, I, didn't, I, I said, yeah, just make sure now. So the fellow beside me, he's all in my conversation. <laughs> and of course, I'm looking raggedy as I usually do, trying to be nondescript and trying to get through there without being bothered. You know, sometimes you're just tired. And, and, and one time I had to counsel a lady in Chicago between the time my plane lay until I got to the next one. She said, oh, Bishop Jones, you know I really have some problems, Bishop, can you? And I had to sit right there and go to counseling. So I tried to get through there real quick and, you know, real looking bad. And so uh, 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 as we were having this conversation, with my secretary to make sure I'm in this property I, and make sure that, uh, everything is set right. And uh, okay, 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 uh, 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 sir, uh, uh, do, do you? Oh, you stay in this this place, huh? I say yes. He say it's quite expensive, though, isn't it? I didn't tell him I, I wasn't paying for it, you know. <laughs> I said, I said, I said, yeah, it's, you know, yeah. He said, yeah, I know it, I know it. It's very expensive. <laughs> Says, what do you do? <laughs> Haters, what do you do? I bless people. <laughs> and I left it like that. You can never lose in humility and not getting in the way of God. I'll give you one example, and I'll give you two examples, and I'll quit. In Longview, Texas, when I first went, I was 24, 25, when I first started pastoring. And incidentally, this is the only job I've ever had. I have done nothing else. I work, I, uh, only job. <laughs> only job. I've had all kind of businesses, but this is the only job I ever had. This is the only job that I ever worked for somebody since I'm 24, and working for God. And when I went there, I was teaching. Little guy, deacons wouldn't tell him how old I was because 
when I first went, there was 25 people, 16 of them was over 65. So I was pastoring the senior citizens uh, home in London. And wouldn't tell them my age, not at all. I was teaching, doing my little teaching, you know, just a little teaching, it couldn't, couldn't be too deep or nothing. And I said that Adam had to leave the garden because the cherubims were going to, the cherubims had to protect him, protect the tree of life from him. And little old lady, sister got up, that's not right. <laughs> you were so wrong. And I said, well, uh, turn to Genesis chapter uh, 3 and we turned and we read it. It was one of those scriptures you don't even have to interpret. It just says it straight out. Now the little flock is looking at me because now I got her. She can't, ain't no wiggle room now. And they're looking at her and they're looking at me because they figure now I'm going to drop the ball. I looked at her and I said, sometimes we read things and we just don't see it clearly. She became the biggest supporter that I ever had in that church. Are you listening to me? Because when I could have crushed her, I backed off. I was in church, and a gentleman in another, in another situation, a gentleman, I was talking about something, and he got up and confronted me. And I could have blasted him out of the, the place because I knew all it was to take him out. I knew it. I had the goods on him. I had the goods on him. And I didn't say a word. Because I didn't say a word, the whole church rallied behind me. Had I said something, here's the reaction. Oh, I sure wouldn't want to be in his shoes. I sure, because it swings the sympathy. On the one hand, you're going to hear, hey, leave my past alone. On the other hand, you're going to hear, oh my, man, I couldn't take no embarrassment like that. And everybody now steps into his shoes, and you have lost them for a moment because you have become the ugly guy. Never become the heavy. Never become the heavy. And I don't care who's got you upset. Don't deal with them from the pulpit. Why should 8,000 people have to listen to you talking to one person in a congregation. You got a problem? Snatch them out, uh, uh, sister so-and-so. Uh, let me see you outside before we preach. Take somebody's hand, if you will. I hope I didn't ramble too much. Amen, I hope I didn't ramble too much. Hope I didn't ramble. I had a whole lot more up here, but we'll do this again. You want your ministry to grow. You are a builder of people, a restorer of value. That's what you do. God uses you to restore value. Everybody's value. I hope that maybe God will lead Bishop Jakes and others of us to put together a system for those of us in ministry who need to be recovered 
Sometimes we've done things we shouldn't do and we're running around scared. At what point am I disqualified? At what point am I disqualified? Hear me clearly. Because sometimes divorces and sexual sins and bad decisions with money whole lot of stuff that happens in ministry. Sometimes drinking too much drugs. Oh yeah, don't, don't look at me like Alice Wonderland. At what point are we disqualified? We need a place to go where we can sit with spiritual people and say, I'm having this kind of personal problem. Got 7,000 people in a church and I'm having a personal problem that can pull the church apart. What it took 20 years to build can fall apart in 20 minutes. We need somewhere to go, somebody who's transparent enough. See, here, here's another thing about preaching. How transparent do you want to be? I hope we can put something together for the plethora of men and women who need somebody. So as you hold hands right now, you not want to inquire what it is that somebody had to come to this meeting to receive some strength in. But as you touch somebody, touch them in the power of the Holy Spirit today and ask God to fix some things among us that's broken. Our Father, we come in Jesus' name and Lord, I don't have to look through anybody. You already know us. And God, I know with what I struggle with that those, my fathers before me, they struggled. They didn't talk about it, but they struggled. And we struggle now. I know, Lord, that if it were not for you, none of us would be able to stand. And so now, Lord, I pray you strengthen my yoke servants. Strengthen my yoke servants. Make a way of escape. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Don't let the consequences be losing a church. Fix them before they break that far. Recover my brother before he breaks that far. Bring my sister back before she falls apart. Too many people are depending on her. Too many people are following him. Step in the gap and back the devil off. And I claim it in the name of Jesus. Build him up again. Build her up again. She's too valuable, Lord. He's too valuable. I claim it right now. Right now. In the name of Jesus, I command you to recover. I don't know who you are, but recover. I, I command you to recover. I, rem I command you to get up again. You messed up, but don't give up. Don't give up. Get up. Get up. Somebody give God the praise. Give God the glory. Bishop. Come on and give God glory and praise for the man of God, for the word of God, for the ministry that we feel in this place. Come on and bless the name of the Lord right now, 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 right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anytime the woman is distracted and the man is discouraged, that's when the enemy destroys. The weapons of division have been launched. The question is, will you fight for the family? You're screaming though your lips don't open, and the worst part of the masculine scream is that the feminine ear cannot hear our frequency. Okay. I don't have to see it if she sees it. I don't have to be good at it if she's good at it. That won't work if we're both sitting behind the wheel. Doesn't mean that you always get it right, but it means you don't run home to mama when you get it wrong. You stay there and work it out. Fight for your family with this invaluable five-part series based on the best-selling book, He Motions. They're available individually, or when you get the set, you'll receive the He Motions book and CD. When you write us, visit our website or call 1-800-BISHOP-2. <laughs> Set sail with Bishop T.D. and Serena Jakes aboard Alaska Cruise 2005. You'll experience intimate sessions with Bishop Jakes and guest speakers, as well as unparalleled food, entertainment, and activities. For more information on how you can cruise with the Bishop, write to us, visit our website, or call 1-800-BISHOP-2.